experience or project or um, excuse me, or anything in that nature where you're really trying to show that impact. So definitely start with the powerhouse blurb. Then two, focus on accomplishments, not duties. So a lot of times what people really kind of fall into the cadence of doing is just listing out what they do in a particular internship or on a project or any role that they have. And what you really want to do is to show what you actually had an impact on. So don't just tell me what you did in the role, show me your impact. So your impact could be you reduce cycle time by 25% through implementing certain procedures um, from a software development perspective. So it really shows that, hey, this is my role, but also the impact that I had on the greater business and the organization. So just get in the cadence and get in the habit of showing that impact now. Um, even if you already have a developed resume, it's always a good thing to kind of be in that mindset to always show your impact because in today's world, data is so important into how we sustain workforces and then also how we um, really show and compete against our peers and our colleagues. And so if you can show the data and back it up, that's going to get you um, that pay raise, is going to get you that promotion. So you always want to make sure that you show your impact and are able to articulate that. And, and, and keep your resume fresh and updated. I, I know a lot of times people will let their resume just sit just because they're busy with school and work and family and whatever else. And so a lot of times people will forget to update their resumes for months at a time. And you want to make sure that this is a living document. And so you want to make a conscious effort, put time in your calendar each quarter to make sure that you're updating your resume with new accomplishments, with new projects, with new ideas, et cetera. So make sure to keep that um, up to date and fresh. And, and number four kind of goes into what we talked about on number two. So quantify whenever possible. So you don't want to have a, all of your bullet points be percentages. You can add in some dollar signs in there. You can add in um, just numbers as far as like maybe headcount or recruiting numbers, but you want to quantify the impact that you're having on whatever you're doing. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, reducing cycle dot time by 25%. I helped raise $5,000 for said organization. I helped recruit 25,000 people for this particular organization. So find ways on how to really show your impact so that you can be more marketable out there in the workforce and out there in the work environment. And then five, include your major and minor. Um, a lot of times people will not always include all of their majors or their minors. Uh, make sure to include that um, just so that we have a clear understanding of what you are studying in school so that we can make sure that that is applicable to the role that you're applying for. And do include your GPA um, if above 3.0. A lot of times companies will have restrictions on any GPAs that are 3.0 and below. And the reason why is just because of general guidelines or the way that it's always been done. So if you do have a GPA that's below 3.0, I would leave it off. And what will happen is they may ask for it. And what you will be able to do is really speak to why your GPA is maybe a little bit lower than 3.0 threshold. And you can explain, hey, I take care of five of my, my fellow um, uh, kids or you have a work or something of that nature that really um, you have to really balance several priorities. So definitely make sure that um, if it's three point and above, you put it on there, but if it's below 3.0, you can leave it off and explain later and people will understand um, what you're going through. Um, avoid acronyms, typos, and errors. So one thing that um, at t is synonymous for is acronyms and, and Jazza will be able to attest to this. We have one billion acronyms and they can mean several different things. And so try to avoid acronyms because you never know who your audience is and you never know if they're gonna understand what the acronym is. And if you do use an acronym, make sure to spell it out and make sure that the person that's seeing it, um, either if they're not a technical person or if they are a technical person, understands what you're trying to say. And also just make sure that you read over your resume with a fine tube comb to make sure there aren't any errors. And so, and one thing that I've, I've done in the past is either had people read my resume for me or I actually changed the font in my resume before rereading it just to see if there were any errors on there. Um, sometimes you look at a document however many times, it will kind of detract from you seeing or prevent you from seeing those little minor mistakes. So um, try out some creative ways to make sure you don't have any errors or typos.
And then eight, do not use I, we, they, me, us, et cetera. Um, you wanna keep it in active voice and that's why we always are gonna start off with those powerhouse verbs. So starting off with those powerhouse verbs helps prevent us from using those identifiers like I, they, me, and us. And then create a custom resume for each opportunity. So a lot of people will have one resume, um, which is great. You wanna have that foundational resume, but you also wanna manipulate and tailor that resume to whatever role that you're applying for. So that could be anything from changing the colors to the company that you're applying for. So if you're applying to AT&T, maybe you use an AT&T Blue. If you're applying to T-Mobile, you may use their um, magenta pink red color that they have. Um, if you're applying to Center, you may use their purple. So really be cognizant of the things that you have in your resume to really tailor make it to the company in the role that you're applying for. Pull some of those words that are in that job requisition and put them in your resume so that when you apply online, it hits some of those filters that it will go through as you apply online. So make sure you tailor make it to the role in the, in the company that you're applying for. Um, include unique skills and interests. Um, so I think this is always something cool and fun that people can put in there um, to include some of those skills and interests. Make sure it's not too outlandish when you put them in there. Um, obviously, we probably don't want to know that you are, you have really great skills in, in skateboarding and things of that nature. That's cool and all, but we want to make sure that it's a little bit applicable to the role itself. Um, so maybe your interest could be hackathons, or group projects or something of that nature. So just make sure it's a little bit applicable um, to just really show and dive into your personality a little bit more. So those are kind of my 10 guiding principles that I live by. And now we're, we'll, we'll join in and I want y'all to come off mute if, if you have the opportunity to and give me some feedback on this resume. So if you were to see this resume come across your desk, um, we'll, we'll spend a minute on this, but if some people wanna kind of come off mute and give me some feedback on this on why this isn't or is a good resume, I would love to hear y'all's feedback on this and we'll kind of rate it as we go along. So y'all come off, you need give me some feedback. I think the font could use a little work. Just okay. below the Fiona Jenkins and other text. Okay, yeah, very good. Consistent font text. Um, for any education, I don't think you would need your primary school. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, high school is, is pretty much not a relevant right now. And then on all the personal details like marital status, children, health, nationality, unnecessary information. Yeah, absolutely. Those are great points. I mean, we don't need to <laughs> have all those things on your resume. That's that's more of like if you're registering to vote or something of that nature. So uh, definitely not the place for your resume. I think for the hobbies and interests, um, they don't really need to know that you like playing video games and watching TV. Right, those are pretty much understood, right? I mean, I, I love watching TV. I, I don't, I love playing computer games. I think those are pretty understood. So yeah, probably not the place to have on your resume. You probably want a more professional sounding email as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hotbabe at mail.com isn't probably the best <laughs> email that you want out there. Uh, so no, <laughs> These are all great feedback. And uh, so all of the things that we talked about um, are, are all great, even the picture. So, I mean, I don't think having a, a flower here as your profile picture, as a resume picture is, is indicative of a good resume. Um, so there's a lot of things on here that we can kind of dwell on and hone in on, but I think we get the gist of what we don't want to have in our resume. So if we have to rate this, we could probably give this one star out of five. All right, so let's move on to the next resume. So let's take a look at this one and uh, give me your feedback on, on this resume. I say it's more detailed than the previous one, especially in the professional experience. Yeah, absolutely. It's more concise. You can clearly see the career objective, the key skills, the pro professional experience, the professional education. So yeah, I totally agree with that. It has like a... Uh, it does the, look like a template, though. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it does come from a template. A lot of uh, people do use, use templates. Uh, nothing wrong with templates, but I would just make sure if you do use a template to tailor make it to, like we talked about earlier, the role itself and to really show your personality. So templates are totally fine. Just make sure you 
are, are making it representative of yourself. You just didn't add the, their own information though. It looks like the template information for filler. Yeah, absolutely. So make sure that if you do use a template that you go ahead and put in your actual details instead of just um, leaving it unfinished. All right. And, and one other thing that I would mention on this, so this is a, a step ahead of what we just looked at in the previous uh, interaction, but um, definitely make sure that if you use a template to utilize all of the space that you have on the resume. So all of this white space here, you want to make sure that you are filling that in with something tangible, um, even the white space here. So make sure that you are doing whatever you can to fill in that space. So um, that means that you have to go out, volunteer, go out, get an internship, get involved with the community um, or a student group, and make sure that you have the content to actually fill up the space. Um, so I would give this one three stars out of five, and then we'll go to the next one. So give me your feedback on this one. And no resume is, is perfect. No resume is perfect. I would say this one is very graphical. Uh, as you can see on the left side, the skills, uh, even though it, it, um, maybe it's a little bit confusing uh, about the color, but overall it, it looks kind of... Um, catchy, I would say. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm not sure how, how good this will, will be with the, um, with the filter, though. like with the resume filter, like the, the algorithm. I'm not sure how it's going to take those. Yeah, those are great points. I mean, this resume has a lot of content in it. It, it does have those catchy things, um, maybe a little bit too much. Maybe we'll want to tone it down a little bit. So maybe take out one or two of the bullet points um, per session or per session, per, per line there, just to give it a little bit more space and readability. So I um, definitely agree with that sentiment there. Any other comments on this one? Okay, um, so I'll, I'll kind of talk about this a little bit more in detail. So um, this is a lot better than the first and a little bit better than the one we just went over in the second sense. And uh, they do a great job of making sure that everything is clearly accessible. So you know where the education is, you know where the skills are, um, experience, et cetera. And they also do a great job of communicating where they can the impact via those uh, monetary integers that we talked about. So here you can see 17%, um, you can see 15% here, and there's some monetary notations in here as well. I would focus in on one, making this a little bit more readable. So maybe take out a, a bullet or two for each of these and, and make the font a little bit bigger so that people can easily um, see it. It kind of blends together right now. Um, also, if you have some kind of visual over here, make sure people understand the scale. So obviously you would infer that this would be out of 100%, but we want to make sure that if you have a visual like this, that you drive a scale to it. So for this one, we'll give this one, uh, five out of five stars, but like I said, each resume can always be different. Each person's gonna have a different perspective when they're reading a resume. Um, so definitely uh, always take it for a grain of salt, but want to just show kind of the different levels of what it's like to have um, a not so good resume, a decent resume, and a more detailed resume. So hopefully y'all all were able to kind of visualize that as well today. Um, so, now let's talk about applying. So we talked about this earlier. When you are applying to a role, you're going to obviously have a job requisition. And a job requisition means it means and is the, the profile for that, that role. So when you go on to a job rec and you see all the qualifications, the roles and responsibilities, all of those things that really draw out what the role will be on a day-to-day -day basis, you wanna pull some key points in there. So a lot of times there'll be redundancies as far as words in those requisitions. And you wanna make sure that you're pulling those and putting them in your resume. Because a lot of times when there are companies such as at and and Google and Amazon, they have such large application applicant pools that they have to have a system filter out their resumes and if you don't have some of those identifying words in your resume, it's gonna kick you out because it's not gonna think that you're qualified for that position. So make sure you read that 
requisition in detail and put some of those words and make sure that you have some of those qualifications listed in your resume. That's an integral point to getting to that next step as um, some people may have not gotten to that next step and that may be the reason why. And then talk to the recruiter. So a lot of people reach out to me on LinkedIn and don't even know who I am um, from the next person, but they're trying to get to someone that can help them find that position that they're applying for. I have no qualms, I have no issues with people reaching out to me. Um, all I would say is if you do reach out to someone and you don't know that they're the specific recruiter for that role, leave a note, especially if you're on LinkedIn, leave a note and say, hey, this is so-and-so, I'm a computer science major from Cal Poly Pomona, I'm very interested in the technology development program that you have at at and and would love to be connected or to hear more about the opportunity. So really just state why, you're, why you are engaging them so that they know that, hey, this person is really interested in the program and either I can help them or I can point them to someone that's going to be able to help them. So make sure you leave a note when you're connecting with people on, on LinkedIn because you want those organic relationships and you want people to understand what you want and need. Um, and then also just research the company and the position. It's um, ever so important now today more than ever to really understand what the company you're applying for and if it aligns with what your career goals are and then also what your personal objectives are. So a lot of people will look at these large companies um, just because they're sexy, but then they get into the company and realize that, hey, there's no work-life balance. It's not the culture that I thought it would be. And they really didn't understand the work they needed to do in preparing and researching the company before they applied to a role. So definitely do your due diligence on making sure that you're applying to companies that align with your morals, with your career objectives, with your community outreach, et cetera, because you definitely don't want to get into a company that doesn't reflect you as a person and what your and what your missions are. So definitely do your research and it's, it's easy to do so. I mean, you could even see by the commercials that people put out there online. I mean, you can really tell a, a company's culture and a company's objectives even by those simple things. And there's obviously platforms like LinkedIn and Glassdoor that you can go in and leverage to make sure that you are applying to a role and to a company that you really are aligned with. So that's all that I had for the resume. I hope you all got a little bit or a little bit of knowledge out of it and some nuggets to kind of take back. So at this point, I'll open it up for Q&A before we go into the next part, which will be uh, me introducing Jazzer into what he does at at and so I'll open up for Q&A. Hey, let's see, are there some questions in the chat? Okay, what are your... Uh, so Ashley, uh, I see your question. What are my favorite and least favorite parts of the job? So my favorite part of my job is really connecting with students and faculty. I mean, I love, like I absolutely love when I'm able to connect with, with you all. It, it just really warms my heart and I just feel a sense of accomplishment and, and fervor when I get to connect with you all, um, especially on things like this where it's professional development because I, lo I love to see people, um, especially people at a highly diverse university like Cal Poly Pomona succeed. Um, and so a lot of us are first generation, um, have to work during school, have to work um, while balancing internships and, and things of that nature um, and so and supporting the family as well. So I, I definitely love connecting with students that may be disadvantaged or maybe first generation. Um, so that's one thing that I love about uh, doing my job. Um, the least favorite thing about my job right now is not being able to be on campus. Like I love seeing people in person. Obviously with COVID, we aren't able to go onto campus. So I would say that's the least favorite part of my job right now. All right, Andrew, do cover letters help even though they're optional? So a good cover letter is, is good for just really substantiating why you wanna work for the company. I don't necessarily have the time to always look through cover letters, but if you include it in there, Andrew, you can definitely, if, if there's a recruiter that does have the time to kind of read through them and sift through them, it can make a major impact. It can really show the commitment and the want and the need to work for that company and kind of what I was talking to earlier, why it aligns with your aspirations and kind of your moral standards and, and your missions and your goals. So I definitely think if you have a well-developed cover letter, 
that some cover letters can be kind of all over the place and not have a defined mission to them. So you wanna make sure that it's concise and that it's getting to the point of why you're submitting it. So cover letters are good in some instances. Great question, Andrew. All right, Darren, could you give a tip on how to be more appealing to employers as a freshman applying for jobs or internships? Uh, great question, Darren. So a lot of companies, um, even at and we typically don't hire freshmen. We typically hire those juniors, those rising juniors and those uh, rising seniors. And so one way to really stand out is to um, go and get as much exposure to student groups and hackathons and projects as you possibly can. And the reason why a lot of companies don't recruit as many uh, freshmen is just because of the work experience. So we want to bring in um, students that have work experience and you're probably saying, well, how do I get the work experience if you're not gonna give me an internship? Um, so that's why I say leverage, leverage those things like hackathons and projects and the leadership opportunities like you being here for the computer science club that you can leverage that and say, hey, even though I don't have an internship, I have all these other experiences that equate or are similar to having an internship. And this is why you should give an uh, give me the internship and why I'm a good candidate for that. So that's kind of how you leverage that, that slight disadvantage, if you will, of being a freshman. Yeah, um, just, uh, yeah just adding on to that, uh, you know, at, at Computer Science uh, CSS, um, we also want to create opportunity for you to uh, be engaged and to uh, have more exposure with the, the work environment. So that's why um, we have um, two projects that's going on right now, which is the mentorship programs, uh, which will expose you to, um, you know, uh, the mentor who has experience that, you know, they can pass on to you. Or if you have homework, you can ask them. Or um, we ha also have a um, CSS PI, which is the uh, projects initiative and in that uh, projects you will get to learn uh, a new language uh, that you can apply to a, a project's idea that we have so um, you know um, to connect to Colin, Colin's, um, Colin's point bill uh, that will be you'll get more experiences in connecting with clubs uh, with the projects that they're they are doing and also be engaged with the members uh, inside a group uh, inside a group so that that creates uh, a more uh, you know, inclusive community. Yeah, Val, and uh, that, that's a great point. And uh, I think, Kayla, you had a similar question to Darren. And one other thing that you should leverage to kind of negate that disadvantage, I'm calling it a disadvantage. It's not really a disadvantage. It's just kind of the, the environment in the industry in, we, in which we live in. But one way to kind of negate that and, and to work around that is leveraging your career center. So I, I am one that really didn't leverage their career center when I was in college and, and got lucky, lucky, thank God. However, I see the value of career centers and they are so connected to different employers or so connected to professional development. Work with them and see if there are any opportunities with companies that may be hiring freshmen. So they'll have a, a pulse and they'll know. Um, so in combination with what Don said, uh, all the professional developments you have here at CSS, also work with the career center and make sure that you're leveraging that because you, you pay for it. So you might as well get your money's worth. So um, definitely go and do that. I, if you need a recommendation, I can definitely um, send you over to them. I have some great friends over there at Cal Poly Pomona. So I could put you in contact with some, some great people. All right, great questions. All right, so in the sake of time, let's move on from the resume review. Uh, if you have questions on the resumes or want me to look at your resumes, um, we'll make sure that my contact information is provided to y'all. Shoot me an email, give me a call, and we'll set some time to look over it. All right. So now let's go into Jazzer, my good friend Jazzer. So I will let you take it over, Jazzer. He's going to take over and show you a little bit about what he does at at and And then once he finishes, we'll go ahead and uh, open it up for another Q&A session. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, and first of all, I just want to say thank you. You know, I know. Um, I mean, just the fact that you guys are, you know, part of the club and you're showing up to stuff like this. That's that's a really good sign. So it shows that you're kind of thinking about your careers and what you're going to do after college and stuff like that. So just bravo to that. I know it can be a little bit tough and all that stuff with 
Corona and you can be doing a bunch of other stuff now. So just first of all, I want to say thank you for just, you know, coming out and hearing us like talk a little bit about it. About um, actually, so I am going to, of course, get to that. I'm going to talk about a little bit how I got to at t but as you know, you know, I, I didn't graduate like too long ago. I said, you know, it was about two years ago. So, um, so I, and I know like for me, I would also attend club meetings like this, uh, engineering club meetings to figure out kind of what I wanted to do kind of in a similar position. So I hopefully have that insight to kind of give you my perspective. I want I want to kind of start off where I started with, you know, briefly and then and how I ended up at at t And then hopefully that could give you kind of um, an outlook. So you're not kind of like lost, kind of like I was in the beginning. It's like, you know, college is great. I'm going to get my degree, but then what? Like, how do we get to the job? And that can be a little bit uh, tough. Uh, it's even crazier now with COVID, but hopefully, uh, you know, I'm going to just kind of share my story. If you guys have questions or anything like that, let me know. Uh, and from there, you know, I'll kind of talk about, you know, how I ended up at at t and then what, I, uh, what, what I'm doing at at t So I started off at Cal Poly like about three years ago. I transferred from Mount Sac. I was a community college student. So I did two years at Mount Sac, three years at Cal Poly. And I was studying uh, electronics and computer engineering. And so... Uh, when it came to my career, right, my fir very first job, and I actually still do it every Saturday, is uh, uh, tutoring at Kumon. I don't know if any of you have done Kumon <laughs> when you're a kid, but most likely if you had Asian parents or non-Asian parents, just parents really wanted me to do while well, you would do Kumon. So I actually still do that every Saturday. So that was like my only first job. And then I got into college and I started, you know, studying. And I was like, okay, I want to start, you know, doing things that's related to my um, major, just, just to get something on the old resume. So that when I graduate, I, I have, um, you know, I have something to show. And that's kind of the mindset you should be in. And if you're, and the fact that you're showing up to this and you're part of this computer science club kind of tells me that hopefully you have that mindset. So uh, I did, um, so uh, I actually started off as a comp sci major at Mount Sac. And then when I transferred, I, I did engineering. Uh, but one of the first things I did was uh, do, was be part of clubs like you are now. So um, just be, uh, as, and you could be in or outside of clubs, but the main thing is, is like do hackathons, do something, do your own project. Uh, I was doing stuff like that too. Like there's um, uh, some apps I would, uh, some, um, you know, I would mess around with like just building like e-commerce websites or there was this like really cool thing. Like do things that are fun too. Like there was a, there was a really cool like API you could call and order dominoes through like just code instead of like just going on their website. So, you know, fun stuff like that, like in, in and outside of club. So if you have like absolutely no experience, as Colin said, that's a great thing to start up. Just do your own projects, be part of Hackathon. You could put all that stuff on your resume and it looks great. That's besides, of course, your, your school projects that you're working on, right? Because in, in CompSci, especially when you get into the higher levels, that's all your work, or like it's all projects. So, so I did that. And then when I transferred to Cal Poly, there was this class I took. It was just a random class I needed to take to fill up my units. Uh, so it was um, it was a, a C CIS class. It was a computer information systems class. We were on, on on like this project. And basically, the teacher, the professor of that um, of that class, he said, if you finished for like if you, if you're one of the first groups to finish this like basically really long project, I'll give you an internship at my um, at my company. Which sounded great at the time. When it, in, the, in the long term, it was. <laughs> so, uh, so I was like really driven to, you know, I wanted to get an internship. I wanted to get again something on my resume. So I did that internship. I mean, I, I finished the project with my uh, group. I was one of the first to finish, and so we were able to get the internship. So that was nice. It was unpaid, and that's, um, you know, I was. That's where I actually really started to get um, my first hands-on experience working with a team and doing dev work. Uh, and that's where I basically I was creating um, e-commerce websites. I was just building um, an e-commerce website for that company. And that's where, you know, Colin talked a little bit about company culture. So what, what that really means is basically what you're, it's a lot of things, but part of it, uh, as he also mentioned, is your work-life balance, how you get along with your team, how like the, the roles are set up, how the hierarchy is set up in the company, like who you're reporting to, who you're working with, how um, different like management methodologies when you really get into work you're going to start hearing agile a lot uh, you're, and you're, you're going to hear like we're agile and stuff like that and you know uh, I'll table that for later but anyway that's kind of that's what it means by company culture so that that was my first stage of company culture so I learned you know what I like what I don't like you know what work-life balance means thanks though at at t I have to say it's one of the best uh, experience I've had in terms of work-life balance 
Uh, but but at this particular company, the way it would work, you know, I was working with two other like uh, students who were devs, and like I had to report to like the CEO all the time, and it was a little bit under pressure, and I, it wasn't great in terms of work life balance. There were times where I was like up at two a.m. trying to figure out like a bug, and like just um, you know we've all been through that. Our code doesn't work. It doesn't work. And then it, finally you figure it out, you know, by scouring Stack Overflow for like a couple um, hours and then you finally get it. So, uh, so basically, that, I mean, it's the same. It doesn't really change. So if you're doing that now, you're, if you're becoming a pro professional at Googling why your code doesn't work, um, that, that doesn't change when you get into the, the industry. So anyway, I did that for about two years. And then from there, I moved on. My supervisor at that company ended up going to another company, and I moved with him eventually. And it was more of that stuff, just doing the more e-commerce dev uh, work. And so I did that for about two or three years. And then I was at the same, you know, during in the meantime, I was applying for internships. I thought of, and this is one piece of advice I'd give you uh, as well, is think of the company you want to work for, a company that you're just interested in, whether it's Apple, Google. Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, all these companies. At the time, and um, you know, I was thinking I really wanted to work for Disney. I'm a huge Disney fan. They own everything I like. They own Marvel. They own they own Star Wars. They own Disney. So I was just like, you know, um, I, I like I like to work for Disney. So I was like, so what I what I would do like almost every day, I'd go on their website, look at their internships, look at their jobs, and basically see what I think I could fit myself into. And I would constantly be kind of updating my resume. Uh, and trying to tie in my the experience that I ha had with my internships, with my work, uh, and with my school and my school projects, I was like constantly updating that so that it would kind of um, um, you know fit or tailor or tailor my resume right to the job description. And so that's really important, as Colin said. Uh, so and and the, the other so that's one piece of advice. Think of the company you want to work for. Go on their website, like AT and T, like you know Google, whatever. Go on their website, look at the job, and constantly tailor your resume. That's number one. Number two, don't get discouraged if you get uh, rejected a bunch of times. It's fine. I've, I've literally received 50 plus rejection emails. It's just part of the process. Don't feel discouraged. It's just, just keep going at it, right? Just, uh, just constantly, you know, one day you'll hit it. So literally uh, after like, I, I can show you the email, like literally after like 30, 40 plus rejections, finally one day there was a internship I applied to at Disney that I, you know, I got asked for an interview. I was freaking out, of course. And so I did the interview. You know, and it was great, and I ended up, and uh, oh, and here's the third piece of advice. So interview time, right? So I was freaking out because this was one of the first, like, bigger companies that I, that I was applying for that I got, uh, got an interview for. So the third piece of advice, as Colin also me uh, mentioned, Career Center. It, w it actually helped me out a lot. I was tailor tailoring my resume with them. So when I was applying, uh, you know, I had them take a look at it. But when it came to interview time, this was with a bigger company, so I really wanted to prepare so I did my research on the company, but you could also set up an appointment with your um, Cal Poly Pomona, like uh, like at the Career Center. They'll do like interview walkthroughs with you. They'll like uh, do um, 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 like fake, not fake interviews, but you know what I mean, practice interviews, practice interviews with you to help you out, kind of calm your no nerves down. They'll give you like a heads up on what questions they might ask in the interview. So that's a good thing to go through. So definitely, as Colin said, utilize the Career Center. Uh, that's where I utilize it. They help me tailor my resume. They help me prepare for them. Those were two great things. And on top of that, um, even while I was applying, so before I got the interview, sometimes they'll have contacts with recruiters. So like Colin said, Colin has, you know, has connections with the career center. Most of all these companies do as well, right? So, so if you're in touch with the career center, you're telling your resume, you're telling your interview, you're communicating with them, hey, I want to apply for this company, they might help you out be like, hey, here's a recruiter, maybe reach out to him, send him your resume. Definitely helps, right? De definitely doesn't hurt to have recruiters email and letting them know, hey, I'm applying for this job, okay? So that's my third piece of advice. Uh, so anyway, did uh, Disney for about two or three years. Uh, I got a contract there. I did that for about a year or so. And then, and then I started applying for AT&T and got that job, thankfully. And, that, and here I am. Uh, now I'm working full time at AT&T. So now, that, now uh, hopefully with a bit of background. Sorry, Colin, I know I'm going over. How much time do I have left? I know I had 10 minutes, but I know what time I started. So I hey, guys, wanted... they're probably... Uh, wrap it up in like five minutes and then we'll got it. Yeah, perfect. Five minutes is more than enough. Okay. So yeah. So now that I'm at AT&T, what, what, you know, what's at AT&T? So if you're looking to, uh, to apply to AT&T, what are some type of projects you're working on? What can you expect out of the job? Stuff like that. Just to get your mind, your ears blown, what it's like. So, um, so as Colin is showing on the screen, 
uh, those are these are two of the products. So AT&T, by the way, is actually a little. Uh, what, one thing I like to mention before I get into the details is was pretty cool at AT&T. They actually own a, a lot more than you think. Um, so I don't know if you know, but AT&T actually owns uh, Warner Brothers. So like if you're into DC Comics, which Warner Brothers own, or if you're into Harry Potter, or like a lot of the media and video games that Warner Brothers produces, uh, it's actually owned by uh, AT&T. So uh, there's some projects like uh, you could potentially work on with Warner Brothers that fall under the AT&T banner. But it's a huge company, right? We're mainly a telecom company, right? So like, um, you know, wireless uh, services. Uh, but we're also a cable slash media company because we own we own uh, DirecTV as well. So that's where you get products like AT&T TV. And then recently you might have heard of, hopefully, uh, uh, HBO Max. So I'm obviously, I mean, I'm not obviously, but uh, we're hearing a lot, especially with our generation and the younger generation as well. Like no one's really using cable anymore. Everyone's kind of moving to, or it already has been their entire lives basically, is on streaming services like Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu. So one of those are AT&T's kind of comp a competitor or competitive uh, streaming app to that is HBO Max. Uh, so that's something uh, that I will uh, that I'm, I have the pleasure of working on as well as at and TV um, And so I'll delve a little bit into these projects. So at and TV by the way, it's kind of basically cable it's Nothing different really. It's just that uh, instead of like over the normal coaxial cable It's like over Wi-Fi or internet. So that that's what at and TV is. HBO Max is again a streaming service So no ads you pay like 12 bucks a month and you get a bunch of stuff you could watch on demand, similar to Netflix and similar to Amazon. So again, so these are the projects I'm working on. What's my role, right? So as I mentioned earlier, I'm a technical business manager. So at Disney and, and earlier before then a little bit, even though I was working as a dev, I was still managing a team. Uh, I was, uh, so, but Disney specifically, that's where I really got my feet wet in project management. So. I wasn't doing much dev work, but I was working with the team, managing them, setting up timelines, expectations, talking with business, talking with testing. You know, you talk with all these different groups to get something delivered on time. So, I mean, you're not really getting that experience, I would say, in school. At least I did. I'm, I'm not sure they're teaching you folks about like agile methodology or waterfall, which is okay because you, you don't necessarily have to know that stuff, but it definitely does help because, especially when you're talking with recruiters, it's a bonus. Like if you tell them, yeah, I'm familiar with. Uh, what like uh, a scrum team is and what that means. So I, I would I would suggest you guys look that up, like what a scrum team is, what agile methodology is. Again, you're not a project manager. At least I, I, I don't think you guys are looking for that necessarily, maybe looking more for software dev. But a software dev or a dev team is part of a scrum team. So if you have that knowledge, it tells the recruiter that, hey, this guy has some experience with, you know, scrum. So like you're not you know, you're not learning all this, this new terminology, like you're a better fit for the job because you have some background on what uh, a scrum team is. So basically a scrum team is a team, uh, you have the scrum master, the dev team and the product owner, and you guys all work together to deliver code basically on a sprint, what they call a sprint. A sprint is like every two weeks you deliver something. So I'm a technical business manager and that means I, I can do multiple roles. Currently my role is a scrum master. So I work with the dev team who manage and deliver code. So um, they're do it, they, they're based on Java. I mean, you're gonna find, you know, depending on the app you work on, you know, it can be from Python to Java to JavaScript to C++ to C Sharp. I mean, it, it can range. But I mean, you know, obviously the languages are different, but they're kind of similar. So like, if you know one, you know, you can pick up another. So when you're looking at the job, you know, application, see what languages they're requesting. And kind of just, if you don't know it, that's okay. Just, you know, take a couple lessons on Code Academy. Just, you know, brush up on the syntax and you should be okay, right? Um, so, so anyway, but the, back to my role. So as a Scrum Master, I manage the team and I basically have to report to program level like where we're at in terms of delivering code. That's like the very basics of it. And uh, what, what code are we delivering? What are we working on? Well, it's tied in with these two products. So for example, whenever you go on the website for AT&T and you want to sign up, for HBO Max, right? You, there's a whole flow you gotta go there. And there, you gotta think of different flows. Like you could call into at and and sign up for HBO Max. You could go online and sign up for HBO Max. You could go to retail, like at and retail stores and sign up for HBO Max or at and TV. And then under at and TV, there are all these packages with all these pricing, all that stuff. So even though these are kind of like simple day-to-day -day things, um, but I mean, I mean, that's what, I mean, you have to have those things set up for consumers like to be able to purchase these things, right? 
So that's essentially what I work on is making, having those flows set up, making sure customers, um, and what if a customer wants to return or what if a customer wants to cancel? So all these flows, all these different pieces uh, that go into the buy, we call it a buy flow. All the, uh, that's basically what I work on. So just creating the code, creating the infrastructure, working with all the backend teams to make sure all this basically functions so customers can purchase like a few max eight. So, um, but again, there, I mean, there, this is just one very small piece of the project, right? You could be working on the UI, like front end of what HBO Max looks like, or on the back end, or, uh, you know, on the catalog. So there, I mean, it's, ex what's nice about ETP is that it's a huge company, you get a lot of opportunities uh, to apply to like, like all these different projects. So whatever you're interested in, you know, there's probably like a project that you could work on that's tied to that. And then, uh, so that's basically what I've done. I hope, I hope I've answered like some of your questions and hopefully kind of gave you an idea, you know, what it's like to work at AT&T and kind of the journey to get there. Um, so yeah, I, that kind of wraps up my, my piece, but if you have any questions, similar to call it, you know, please let me know. But, uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, for hearing me out. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jazzer. It's always great hearing from you. And, uh, thought out of if you want to open it up for Q and A, or if you have like a cr closeout process with that, I'll let you kind of lead us. Yeah, in, um, in sure. Yeah. So right now will be a Q and A for our, all of our, um, Colin as well as Jasper. So I know that the time we only have about seven minutes left, but if you guys have any other questions, you know, we'll, we'll drop in the emails of the, of the, you know, Jasper and Colin also for, for you to um, contact and, you know, ask for advice if you might. Well, so, um, questions, if anything, uh, yeah. So just tap in the chat if you guys have any questions. Yep. Um, thank you for uh, your speech and for today. I've got a question. Uh, with your experience working in AT&T and seeing all of these uh, services moving into the um, like the the IP space versus just straight coax space, um, what do you see uh, with ISP's expansion of uh, fiber, the last mile fiber to the home? Uh, I've been seeing a lot of um, advertisements um, on on streaming platforms saying, oh, fr uh, Frontier's got uh, fiber for $40 a month, some crazy value, um, um, but it's almost an outright, ri outright lie uh, because fiber to the home is almost non-existent in the U.S. Uh, I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I don't, I mean, great question. Yeah, um, definitely. I'm, <laughs> I mean, that. I wish I had fiber, right? Uh, I don't even have at in my area. Uh, I actually have Spectrum. So I think, um, I think that falls under charter. But um, I, I'm, I might have to ask you to read the question, but I think you're just, uh, number one, I'm not, I'm not really working in, um, so like I said, at and is a huge company. There's wireless. There's, um, again, uh, the, kind of like the ISP infrastructure, as you're uh, mentioning. There's um, and then there's kind of like media and video video products, which is what I'm in. So like HBO Max, ATP. But I, just, I mean, sure, I'd love to talk shop about like ISP because I, I mean, I'd love to have fiber myself. I mean, you know, it it is uh, definitely um, not a concern, but definitely I think something that customers, including myself, want. I mean, we do in a day and age where we're streaming in 4K HDR we're basically doing everything online, we're gaming online, it's like there's definitely a need slash want for um, faster internet speed at a, at a, you know, decent price. I think the most exciting thing that came out of that, uh, but it's kind of old now, I was going to say recently, but I mean, it really hasn't been brought into the discussion, um, was like Google Fiber. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but that's where it's like you're getting crazy speed, like a gig per second, I could be exaggerating there, but it was like like thousand megabytes per second um, because of actual, like they go into cities instead of fiber connections. The main issue there, as I'm sure maybe you know, I don't know, I don't know if you look into it, but it seems like you're interested in it, is um, unfortunately these large companies like Verizon, AT&T, Charter, um, not really Google, I wouldn't necessarily say, but um, yeah, they have, they kind of own I guess certain zip codes. So you'll notice like there's not much, you'll get maybe one or two ISPs per like zip code. And so what that means is that really, <laughs> it's not really good because there's not much um, uh, competition. So then you're not really getting uh, like, I guess, uh, motivated to create like that fiber in infrastructure. 
but I know I, I know there's maybe some like government like discussion going on there where they're like asking companies like AT and T to um, build that infrastructure so customers actually do get fiber. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean it's just kind of a stalemate, ongoing thing. It's just you're lucky if you're in a, in a zip code that has it. I wish to be, uh, as I mentioned, but. That's that's kind of where I'm at with ISPs and and like and the um, the whole infrastructure thing. But I know I know AT and T like from what I know I I don't know about like uh, internet infrastructure specific, infrastructure specifically. But what I've heard like from in the within the company, the main focus now, I guess the most relevant would be the expansion of five G. I'm, I'm sure you've heard a lot of that. Um, so they're talking shop about that a lot. Everyone wants to be the first to 5G. So like Verizon's doing it, AT&T is doing it, T-Mobile's doing it. And then also they're talking about this doesn't really have to do with front freight like consumers, but uh, with uh, first responders. So um, AT&T has something called FirstNet, and it's basically a network infra infrastructure dedicated specifically for first responders. So like police departments, uh, fire departments, uh, military. Uh, stuff like that. So, so basically, if, you know, they're getting calls or emergency calls, like they have that infrastructure that's really fast, that's dedicated just to them. So that's kind of the conversations I've been hearing around um, the company regarding that. But in terms of specifically ISP infrastructure, you know, I don't know if there's any expansion it's specifically in fiber. I'm hoping, you know, there is, but, but to my knowledge, I mean, I don't know if Collins or anything, but to my knowledge, it's been it's pretty much gonna stay the way it is. I, I'm sure they're expanding in some areas, but I haven't heard any, I haven't heard much of it. Anyway, I know that was a long response. I hope that answered your question. But if you want to reiterate, I, I, I'd I'd love to take another stab. Absolutely, I just wanted to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Hey, I'll step in right quick. So, hey, Dan, quick question for you: What experience should we get in high school aside from participation in clubs and competition to expand our resume? such as courses or program languages. So there are actually a lot of companies that have programs for high school students. So I don't know if you are in high school, go to your counselor and see if they have any connections with either the, the school systems that can kind of get you to that place. Um, at and in my realm of HR, we don't have anything where we directly deal with um, high schoolers, but I know that there are parts of at and that do. Um, so get with your counselor, see if there are any programs that you can work with larger companies, such as like Northrop Grumman, AT&T, et cetera, to, to do those co-ops. Um, so that would be my advice for you to get that, that experience in, in high school. Yeah, and to, add, and to kind of add on to that, one thing you just made me think of, and we, it's actually offered it within AT&T. So if you're doing it like outside of AT&T, that's like super cool, um, a nano degree. So you could, you could probably start on that in high school. Like if you're into... Um, like if you're into like coding and programming and you're kind of ahead of the curve in that way where you're like a good self-starter, self-learner, look into nano degrees. You do have to pay a little bit. I don't think it's that much and they might even have discounts for like uh, students. Um, so I, I would look into that. Nano degrees are like super cool. You work on projects, you have people looking at your projects and it's, it's a, I, I think it's a highlight on the resume for sure. If you have like a couple nano degrees on your belt, I think it's a good, um, it's a good thing to have on my resume. That's a great point, Jazzer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I think we do have some other questions that is coming in, um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the time doesn't allow. And I, I, you know, I myself have some questions I want to ask too. But uh, yeah, like I said, uh, it's um, yeah, we're running out of time. So you know, thank thank you so much for uh, your presentations, uh, Colin and then Chancer. Um, I, I think that sorry, <laughs> so I uh, so I think it's is. You know, it's really great to have you all here. And if you, if anything, so, you know, you guys can drop in your emails or maybe your LinkedIn uh, in chat so that people can see. And I'll, I will also post it on our social media also. So. Yep. And by the way, like I, I generally love, love to answer like all your questions. So honestly, if you really want to ask a question, um, Juan, I think you have your, my email. Um, if not, I'll, I'll send it to you. Do you have my email? You do? If not, get it from Colin. Colin should have it. So yeah, you have we'll my email. We'll yeah. So just uh, if you guys have like a burning question you really wanted to ask, you didn't get a chance, no worries. Just, just shoot me an email and I'll, I'll be happy to answer when I can. All right. Okay. All right. Th thank you so much, Colin and uh, Chester. Um, yeah. If anything, I'll just contact you. Uh, and if any one of us want to contact uh, Chester or Colin, 
uh, we can also um, help you with that. All right. Yep. All right. All right. Thank, thank you so much. All. all right. Thank you guys. Thanks, all. All right. Bye. Bye. Take care. Take care, y'all. All right. Bye -bye. See y'all.